Hi everyone, this is Pastor Justin of Evansville Pilgrim Holiness Church. The message you're about to watch is one that's been recorded in one of our live services, hoping that you will get some spiritual benefit and nourishment out of it. We trust it's a blessing to you and to your family. If you would like to contact us or know more about us, please look us up on our church website at evvphc.com. If you're interested in supporting our ministry financially, there's a donate button there as well that you can use. Or if you just want to stay in touch and up to date with everything going on in the church, please connect with us on Facebook at Evansville Pilgrim Holiness Church. Again, we hope you get a lot of good out of the message that you're about to see and enjoy it. And we'd love to see you in person soon. God bless. You know, we're going to talk a little bit this morning about the idea that, not the idea, the fact, scriptural fact, that God is love. And, um, you know, when you talk about love, love's a, it's a universal subject, I would say. It doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your upbringing, it doesn't matter your social status or your financial well-being. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter your culture, it doesn't matter your religion or the lack thereof. It, humankind, no matter where you go, is enthralled by the topic of love and, I would say, the feeling of love. Now, those are kind of two different things. There's different definitions of love, um, but just the idea of it in general is something that um, I feel like most of humankind spends their entire life chasing after in one form or another. Um, for a sinner, what that seems to do, at least what my experience was, is it leads to, uh, until you change from being a sinner, it leads to a lifelong pursuit of the next person or the next thing to love. The thing that you're hoping will bring you satisfaction, will fill an emptiness, a longing that's inside. Um, there's just a deep void in an individual's life who's not, who's not experienced true love. For the Christian, the idea of love becomes a different topic and a very different experience, and it really is based upon this scripture that I'm going to read to you and the one that I've got on the screen that I'll also use as a background of the text this morning. God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let's see what the Bible has to say about this idea of love. 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to begin at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this, the love of God, was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love, we love because he first loved us. I'll draw you back again here to verses 7 and 8. He who loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not know God, uh, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And then we look at this verse. God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We see through this and through 
a verse we all know so well, John 3.16, God exhibited his love towards us in such a way that he gave his son. Basically, the scripture foundationally gives us this truth. The gift of, of Jesus to be the Messiah as Christ for on behalf of our sins, the gift of Jesus is proof of God's love. That's the way that the scripture pulls it out to us. And so, um, he commends our love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That gift is proof that God loves us. For God so loved the world, that. Right? Because he loved us, he did the rest of the story. God so loved the world, that. He gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, I want to take a little bit of time this morning and look at these four words here at the end of Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Christ died for us. And how do you make four points of a message out of four words? Well, I'm going to do my best to do that this morning. But let's have a word of prayer before we jump into it. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again this morning for your faithfulness unto us. We thank you, dear Lord, for your love and grace and mercy that's brought us each one to this place today within your house, dear Lord. And Father, those that are within the sound of my voice, both those here now and those that will access it later, we thank you for your faithfulness in their life and the grace and mercy that's brought us to where we are. We trust, dear Lord, that each one has accepted the, the gift of your love and of the sacrifice of your son. But if not, we pray, dear Lord, that you would be faithful to their hearts today, that you would draw each one closer to you. Father, those that need encouragement, bring encouragement today. Those, dear Lord, that perhaps need to draw closer and should be under a time of conviction, be faithful to their souls as well as your will would have it. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen and amen. Thank the Lord. Christ died for us. I think through those four words we can begin to understand each of us the love of God. Remember the scripture that I started with tells us that if we know anything about love, if you have an accurate definition of love, there's only one way that happens. And that's because you know God and you've come to walk with him personally and his love gets imparted into us as we accept him as our Savior, as the difference, as the propitiation for our sins, the Scripture says. That word basically means he's the sacrifice on our behalf, the thing that puts us in a place that we can be accepted of that. If you know anything about love, it's because you know God. There is no love apart from God, not true love, not the real definition. And so if we're going to understand the true definition of love, I think we can do it through these four words, Christ died for us. First of all, I want to talk to you a little bit about Christ. The word Christ in English means the Messiah. That's what it stands for. It's the promised one that the Jews of the Old Testament were looking to that was to make the difference for all the world. And somewhere around the year A.D. 33, there was a man named Pilate who was a Roman governor over Judea who had brought a man named Jesus born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, and because of that, known as Jesus of Nazareth in the history books. He had brought him before him because he had been accused, accused of being a blasphemer, of one that was worthy of death by the Jewish leaders of the day. They had brought him before the civil governor. Pilate had come to the place where he was finished questioning Jesus concerning these accusations that had been brought against him by the leaders of the Jews. And he states aloud, I can find no reason to put this man to death. He's innocent. I can't find anything to hold against him. And yet he knew at that moment that if he didn't give the people what it is that they wanted, that it was very likely that a riot was going to break out throughout Jerusalem. And so finally, he addresses the impatient mob that's waiting outside the palace, and he asks them, What shall I do with this Jesus who is called Christ? To which the mob is raised up and begins to shout back at him, literally, as I picture him out on his balcony speaking over top of the crowd. And the shout comes back to him in unison as a chant, Crucify him! Crucify him! Now I'm going to back up the story of what happened with a lot of Old Testament scripture this morning out of the book of Isaiah, where the prophet Isaiah foretells what it is that's going to happen to the Messiah. 
the Christ. In chapter 53, Isaiah says that he's going to be one that is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So Pilate gives in to the cries of the mob. He commits Jesus to be crucified, but first to be flogged and scourged and beaten. The soldiers, the Roman soldiers, take Jesus. They lead him away for his beatings. He was stripped of all of his clothing. He was tied with his hands on the one side of a post and his back facing outward. And they begin to beat him. Beat him with a weapon that was in all likelihood leather straps that had been cut into strips. But tied on the end of those would be bits of metal or bone or lead. Chunks of anything they could find that would be sharp and inflict pain beyond just simply a leather strap. As if that's not enough. Any of you ever get spanked by mom or dad with a belt? My dad never spanked me with anything but his hand. Ever. But that's not true for my mom. <laughs> A leather belt doesn't feel too good. And you know what really hurts is when they make a mistake and use the end with the buckle on it. Now, thank the Lord I've never, again, I don't think I've ever spanked my children with anything but my hand. And uh, if you're against me spanking them, we can have a discussion afterwards. But it did pretty good for me, and so far it seems to work pretty good for them. I'm not talking about beating them until they're black and blue. I'm talking about a little something to get their attention so they understand Dad's still in charge. But here we see that just, it wasn't just leather straps. They tied pieces into it. There's a Jewish historian who's known as Josephus that wrote a giant historical book about all the things that happened around the time of Jesus. And he reports specifically that a man named Jesus was brought before Albinus and was, quote, flayed to the bone with scourges. Eusebius writes that certain martyrs of the day were, quote, lacerated by scourges even to the innermost veins and arteries, so that the hidden inward parts of the body, both their bowels and their members, were exposed to view. That's the type of beating that Jesus went through. After the scourging, the soldiers went forward and they put a robe on Jesus. It was probably an old thrown away garment that one of the soldiers had owned. We know that everything that happens throughout this process was done with the intention to degrade him and mock him and push him down. And so we see in one of the Gospels that it says it's a robe of scarlet, but two of the others said it's a robe that was purple in hue. So very likely it would have been a garment that maybe was originally a beautiful deep dark red, but was badly worn and faded and, and, and sun-worn and just ragged and not much left to the point that it almost appeared purple. And that was the best way that they could find to mock him, put a garment on him that was intended to resemble one like royalty would have worn, a beautiful purple robe. That was a symbol of royalty, it was the color violet or purple. And they meant to mock him. And so they found this old dirty robe and threw it on over top of all of his scrapes and wounds that were already there. Again, their aim is to make a complete mockery of Jesus and his claim to be king of the Jews. Of course, to them, they thought every king needs a crown. And so they went out and they began to weave a crown out of thorns. And if you know anything about thorns in the Middle East, I've not been to the Middle East yet. Lord willing, I'm going to make a trip there someday. But I have been to South Africa and I've seen their thorns and their trees and things that they call thorns. Now, when we think thorns, we think a rose bush or a little briar bush that's got little thorns about like this, right? The trees over there, when they have thorns, have spikes that are an inch or two long. And so it's very likely that it's this type of bush that they took and they wove it into a little circle that would have looked like the outline of a, a bird's nest or something, but it's got these giant thorns on it and they wrap it into a circle and they cram it down over top of his head where the thorns crushed into his brow and into his scalp. Blood would have run down his face in gushing streams as the spikes sunk deep into Jesus' head and against the skull. Isaiah tells us in chapter 52 that Jesus, the Messiah, he doesn't name him as Jesus at the time, but this is who he's talking about. It said his appearance would be so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Disfigured beyond recognition, not only as who he was, but even beyond looking like a human being anymore. Why? Because they didn't treat him like anyone in their right mind would treat 
another human being. Why? They hadn't experienced the love of God. What's all this have to do with love? I'm going to get back to it. We're talking about the Christ part. Christ died for us. Following the crown that was stuck upon his head, a staff was put in Jesus' right hand to act as a scepter of sorts. And then the soldiers fell on their knees and paid mock homage to him as they cried out, Hail unto King of the Jews! They would spit upon him and take the rod, quote, scepter out of his hand and strike him upside the head and I'm surely down probably his rib cage and all over again and again and again. Isaiah chapter 50 says, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and from spitting. And throughout all of this process, this might be the most incredible part. Jesus remained completely silent. He was guilty of nothing, and yet he never said a word in his own defense. Isaiah chapter 53 says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Yes, others cried out for the innocence of Jesus. Judas, even who betrayed him, said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Pilate announced, I find no fault in him. The thief that hung on the cross beside him eventually said, This man has done nothing wrong, as is recorded in Luke chapter 23. The centurion, the guard, after when Jesus has died and the miraculous things that follow begin to take place, cries out, Truly, this was the Son of God. Others cried out for his innocence. But Jesus said not a word. He was beaten and mocked and spat upon, and yet he took it all in complete and total silence. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23 says, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Who's that? God the Father. He's doing all this willingly, knowing what it is that he was going to face, because he's committed himself into the plan of the Father. Christ died, and he did it willingly. Hebrews chapter 9 says, It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. We've all got an appointed time when we're going to die, but for Jesus, it was a choice. Because he chose to be born, that he might die. He even said in his own words, we see it in John chapter 10, Jesus said, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Christ died willingly. Christ died for us. Let's move on to that word that he died. Jesus, Philippians chapter 2 tells us, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This wasn't any ordinary death. This was a death of suffering on a cross. It was a death in humiliation and agony. Crucifixion in its very form was often uh, one that was intentionally commanded upon people. It was the sentence that was given for the most heinous of crimes. Often the crucifixion victim was forced to carry his own cross out to the place of execution. And Jesus is no exception. At least to begin with, they begin to force him to carry his own cross out. But he was in no condition to carry a heavy cross. Eventually the soldiers grow impatient with Jesus' agonizingly slow pace. And so they grab a man named Simon from out from along the way and make him carry the cross for Jesus. But even with Simon carrying the cross, apparently Jesus, because of the beating and, all, and the loss of blood and all that was ongoing, was still too weak to walk. Mark wrote it and said they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, but the Greek word written in there where they say brought was one that was expressed in such a way that he was probably almost carried to the place. Very likely had a soldier under each arm supporting him as he tried to walk up that hill to a place called Mount Calvary. We've all seen it on a sports field, right? Somebody gets injured and to try to get them off, they can't walk on their own power and so they put their arms over somebody and basically more or less get carried off 
carrying very little of their own weight. That seems to be the idea here of how Jesus made his way up that hill. The place that he went to was a place that's termed Golgotha. That's an Aramaic word meaning literally a skull or the place of the skull. It's generally assumed and understood that the place where Jesus was crucified would have been something like a steep rocky hill out near the edge of it, a place that had the appearance of a skull. To this day, if you go visit Jerusalem, just north of the city walls, there's a place that very clearly holds that description and, or, or, and really looks that way. To this day, it's known as Gordon's Calvary. It bears still an eerie resemblance to a human skull. In all likelihood, that's the place where the crucifixion took place. We're not talking about some fantasized, made-up story, friends. We're talking about an actual historical happening. Today we look at a cross very differently than people of that first century would have. Today it's used as a decoration in cemeteries and churches and jewelry and all sorts of other places. But in ancient times, crucifixion upon a cross was synonymous with horror and shame. It was a death that was inflicted on slaves and bandits and prisoners of war and revolutionaries and those that committed acts of treason. The cross was so offensive that the Romans refused to allow their own citizens to be crucified no matter their crime. It did not matter what you did. Crucifixion was not an option for a Roman citizen. They had different rules for themselves. In fact, in Acts chapter 22, that's the next sermon in the series that we're preaching, that's one of the things that happens. We talked last week about how Paul was going to Jerusalem no matter what happened. And when he gets there, sure enough, he gets bound up. He's put in prison. They begin to ask him why it should be that they don't kill him. And eventually, just before he's to be beaten, he looks at the Roman guard and says, are you allowed to do this to a Roman citizen? And they have to let him go because they get scared. They're disobeying their own law. That's the type of law we're talking about that they had made against crucifixion. Cicero, who's a Roman orator about a hundred years before the life of Christ, wrote crucifixion as this. He said, it's the most cruel and disgusting punishment. It's a crime to put a Roman citizen in chains. It is an enormity to flog one, sheer murder to slay one. And what then shall I say of crucifixion? It is impossible to find the word for such an abomination. That's the words of Cicero. He said, let the very mention of the cross be far removed, not only from a Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his eyes, and his ears. Don't even think of it. It was an abomination. But it was done as a mockery, as a public punishment. It was made into a public spectacle. Often... The people would be hung on the cross in bizarre positions. Some of them, if your crime was particularly bad, upside down. And then, generally, their bodies would be left hanging on the cross to be devoured by vultures. The process of dying would go on for hours, if not two to three days, depending upon the condition and the person and the way that they were hung on the cross. They would be completely stripped down and would hang in the heat of the sun, struggling to breathe. The process of being hung on the cross, there were some different ways that people died, but one of the things that had to be done to maintain your life is find a way to breathe. They couldn't stand, there was no way to put weight, and so your body would, would invariably droop and hang and drag under its own weight. And in order to breathe, they would have to in some way pull up with their arms and push with their legs and try to get a breath before they let their body fall again. And as they became weaker and weaker, this process became more difficult and more painful. Today we don't allow torture and things such as the idea of waterboarding, like the idea of making someone feel like they're drowning. But the idea of a cross was the same exact feeling. You couldn't get your air, you couldn't breathe, and this idea of paranoia that would set in for fear of lack of being able to breathe would set in over and over, over hours on end. Eventually, death, the end would come either through heart failure or brain damage caused by reduced oxygen supply or suffocation or just pure shock. It was an awful physical agony 
It was that there was a length to the torment. And yes, included in all of it is the public shame. Combined together to make crucifixion the most horrible version of death that we can imagine. Christ died for us. When Jesus went to be hung on the cross, the cross first would have been laid on the ground. His weak body would have been tossed down on top of the beams, his hands and feet tied with some sort of binding to the cross beams. So then they could take long iron spikes and crude hammers and pound them in through his wrists and through his crossed over feet, through his ankles. And then, once it was all pounded in, they would have taken loose the bindings that helped hold him up to where the only thing that was there was something that was ripping his flesh and his wrists and then his ankles and pushed the cross up over a hole and let it fall in with a thud. And I can only imagine the excruciating pain that came as that whole process was underwent. Imagine the very Son of God nailed in nakedness to a cross. But there's a reason for it all. Christ died for us. For. What's the reason? Well, the reason for the persecution and the death, the object of it all, is you and I. Isaiah 53, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by His wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What are we talking about? Christ died on our behalf. We were the object of the sacrifice. The story is told during the Civil War of a conscription that was made towards people, but when it was made, it was not absolute. And by that I mean what now we would call the drafting process. The Union Army was trying to get people to come and fight, and I don't know what the South did, but this is the version that the Union do, and when they did, and when they would draft a man, if he didn't want to come and serve or wasn't able to come and serve himself, he was given an option. You could find a substitution to go on your behalf, if you didn't want to go or had some reason not to go, or in most cases, could afford to hire someone else to go in your place. The idea of the government was, when we draft somebody, we don't care specifically who the individual was, we just need a body to fill the spot. And so if for some reason you can afford to send somebody else or convince someone else to go in your place, then so be it. And because of that idea, there was a story about a farmer. His name was Blake. He had gotten drafted, he got the message, the letter that he had been drafted into the Union Army, and he was deeply troubled about this. He was going to have to leave his family, and that was particularly difficult in this case because his wife had already died. There would be no one behind to support and take care of his children in his absence. He was deeply concerned that they would quickly become orphaned, whether by his death or simply by his absence. Literally the day before he was called to leave for the army, his, name, his neighbor, whose name was Charlie Durham, came to visit him. And he said, Blake, I've been thinking. You're needed here at home, so I have decided to go and serve in your place. You don't owe me anything. I'm not doing it for hire. I'm doing it on behalf of your family. I will go in your place. Blake was so overwhelmed for a few moments that he was completely speechless. The offer seemed simply too good to be true. He grasped the hand of young Charlie, and he praised God for the one who was willing to go as a substitute. Just a few days later, in his very first battle, Charlie Durham was killed. And when the farmer Blake heard the bad news, he immediately, the story says, got up, got out a horse, rode to the place of the battlefield, picked up Charlie's body and brought it back home. He buried him out back in the churchyard near the spot where the two had often stopped to talk after services and took it upon himself to put a tombstone over Charlie's grave. He personally took out 
and a, a chunk of marble and begin one piece at a time to chisel out what it is that he wanted it to say, and he chiseled out this inscription to place over Charlie's grave. He died for me. And friends, that's exactly the idea of what Jesus, as the Son of God, came to earth to do for you and I. He died for me, and my place as my substitute. I'm the one that sinned. I'm the one that deserved it. He was without sin completely, yet he paid the penalty for my sin and my place. Christ died for us. Who's included in that word us? Well, it's described in different ways. And the, the couple verses preceding Romans chapter 5, verse 8, verses 6, 7, and 8, we see here that the us here is a version of mankind that is powerless, it says in verse 6, that is ungodly in verse 6. Those that are sinners, it says here in verse 8. This here, this verse tells us and teaches us that God helps those who cannot help themselves. We are powerless, ungodly sinners. We have no way to provide justification in our own self. Christ died for sinners. Those that had no reason to be loved or cared for or have any other direction. Those that deserve the penalty themselves. Those of whom such I was one is who Christ came and died for. You say, I don't understand how He could love me enough. I don't understand how He loved me enough either, but He did. That's the fact of the matter. What are we talking about? We're talking about the love of God that was exhibited in such a way that Christ died for us. I want to talk to you a moment about the nature of God's love. What does the gift of Christ dying for us tell us about God's love? Well, first of all, it is undeserved. It's given here, verse 8 says in Romans chapter 5, while we were still sinners. Someone put it this way in their own words. I kind of like it. It said, in the gospel, the good news that Jesus came and died that we might be saved. In the gospel, we discover we are far worse off than we thought, and we are far more love than we had ever dreamed. We as individuals are far worse than we ever thought that we were. But in it comes a far better pardon and answer than we could ever dream of because we are more loved than we can ever understand. God's love is undeserved. God's love is without equal. John chapter 15 says, Greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's the pinnacle of human love. That's the idea of sacrificing in the place of another. We can't say that Jesus is the only one to ever do that. I just told you a story of another person that did, right? Cared enough about his neighbor and his neighbor's family that he put his self in his place knowing chances were that he was not going to come back home. You might be willing to lay down your life for a loved one. But let me ask you this question. Would you ever die for someone who's not even your friend? Someone that treats you terribly? Romans chapter 5, if I back up a verse, says this, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good one some might, someone might possibly dare to die. But God commends His love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners... Christ died for us. God's love is unequaled. God's love is universal. It's available and exhibited towards everyone. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love is universal, but it's also very personal. Galatians chapter 2 says, Christ gave himself for me. That was Paul writing that. But just as equally, every single one of us can put our name in that place. God gave himself for me. Knowing that I was going to turn against him. I'm going to use another war reference this morning. It seems the greatest acts of valor and courage and love that we know of 
as humans oftentimes comes in the most difficult times and time of war would certainly fall within that. During World War II and what's now termed the Battle of Britain, the Germans had decided that it was time to go in and overtake Great Britain. And as part of that, they were putting great siege specifically upon London. There was a plan by which they were going to do that that included a mighty air force that was to fly in across the little gap that there is between the island of Great Britain and in Europe where they had made a base and they were going to storm and bomb everything and then find their way across to get in and attack the land. Great Britain had built basically their entire defense system upon two things. An early warning alert system that was around the entire island so that they could hopefully get their own planes up in the air fast enough if air power were to come. And just as importantly, if not more importantly, the strongest navy known to man in the world. Even stronger than ours in the United States because they're an island, right? If somebody's coming to attack them, they're either coming through the air or they're coming across the water. And so, one side of that, here is the Air Force. Here comes Hitler's force coming in as an invasion of the British Isles. The alarms go off. The Royal Air Force of Great Britain gets their planes up in the sky and for hours has a fight like none other that's conducted in the air. They were able to back off the power of the Air Force. They defeated largely, although with many deaths, the German Air Force that had come in. And afterward, Prime Minister Winston Churchill got up and made a speech in the House of Commons in Great Britain. And he made this statement that has ever since been one of the most popular of anything surrounding World War II. He says, Never in the history of mankind have so many owed so much to so few. Never in the history of mankind have so many owed so much to so few. And he's talking about those few pilots that did the fighting. But I beg to differ with Winston Churchill. When we consider the cross of Christ and the fact that Christ died for us, I would put it like this. Never in the history of the universe has mankind owed so much to one. Because Christ is himself paid the price universally for all of mankind for all of time the nature of God's love it's unequaled it's undeserved it's universal and then because of that we look into what our response ought to be to it and this is where I come full circle back to where I started in 1st John chapter 4 first of all because of God's love we ought to accept it I should receive God's gift of love. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of God's love that's so universal yet so individual, it applies to you. That though to this point in your life, perhaps you've not followed God the way that you've ought to, you've went a different direction, your life is still filled with sin. There's a difference that can be made because God has already provided the perfect gift of eternal life that's available through the sacrifice of Jesus. Christ died for us. God offers eternal life to anyone and everyone who will receive it by faith. I should receive God's gift of love. Secondly, I should love God in return. Here we find in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. And he exhibited His love toward us. And that Christ died for us. goes on in the next chapter, chapter 5 and verse 3. There's this question, how do I prove that I love God? Well, it's answered, this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. Not only do we keep His commandments, but we do it because we want to, not just because we have to. That's true love. It's my desire to please God. I receive God's gift of love. I love God in return, which means I begin to pattern my life after what pleases Him and what He calls right. I call right and live according to that. And what He calls wrong, I call wrong and stay away from it and don't do those things. That's a pretty simplified version 
But it's just that simple. And then, as you love God, you'll begin to love others as God loves them. Since God has so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 11 says. And yes, that includes even those who treat us terribly. What did Jesus say? All that experience he went through that I've tried to portray to you this morning and I'm sure done a poor job of. Any words I say still can't come to the place of beginning to put the true picture in your mind of all that he went through. But after all of that, Jesus, hanging on a cross, cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Earlier in life, Jesus had preached very clearly, love your enemies. You say, well, I understand what you're saying. You're saying that, that, that I should receive God's gift of love and I should begin to love God and I should begin to love other people. What if I don't love God? What if I'm not living that way? Then what happens? Well, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 6 says, those that know of the goodness of God and His love and the sacrifice of Jesus as His Son, yet continue in their sin... In disregard for that perfect sacrifice, this is what it says happens. You crucify Jesus afresh and you put him to an open shame. It's not my words, that's scripture. In Hebrews chapter 10 it goes on and says, Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses died without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse a punishment will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace. What's all that mean? We have a perfect free opportunity. But it's saying if you knowingly and willingly decline that, it's as if you were the soldier that nailed him to the cross and dropped it in a hole and watched him die and thrust a spear through his side. He did it on our behalf. But he did it because we were expected to receive it. Not deny it. You see, there's a required response if one is to know and understand true love. You must accept the love of God. And understand that the love of God is meant to draw you to a place of changing your life from the pursuit of what satisfies you to a pursuit of what satisfies God and pleases God. I, without a doubt, expect that across the world today, there's messages being preached of the love of God, and, and wonderfully so. I hope so. But I'm afraid a lot of those messages are something to the effect of God loves you no matter who you are and what you've done. But they stop there. And friends, I'm here to tell you the Word of God goes a little bit further than that. It's true. God loves you no matter who you are and what you've done. But He did it, and He did it in such a way that He gave a sacrifice not that you would stay in the things you've always done, but that there could be a transformation to where you come to a place you know Him personally and individually and completely and allow your life to be transformed by His love. And I promise you on the experience that you don't understand what you're missing. If you've not experienced true love, if you've not come to know God, you've not experienced true love. And if you've not experienced true love, you're missing the very thing that God created us to do to serve Him in perfect love and harmony. And that's why there's this emptiness and longing and empty just feeling that will be in your life until you come to a place where you exhibit your love toward God and service to Him. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And then he tells what that is. Depends on which translation you're reading. King James says that is your reasonable service. It's the least you can do for what Christ did for you. Maybe the more literal meaning is that that, as you present yourself as a living sacrifice, is your spiritual worship. It's the greatest form of honor that you can give to God for what He's done, is that you give Him your service and return. And until you do this, you'll never know or experience true love, because God 
is love. You'll never feel the empty longing and void inside. Yet I'm so thankful this morning that I came to a place where I accepted it. And I can live out with truth what was said here when John wrote down, We love because he first loved us. You say, boy, if you loved me, you'd have been a little nicer and kinder in your presentation this morning. I, I, I beg to differ. <laughs> I love you so much that I refuse to sit back and watch you continue send yourself toward damnation for eternity. Why? Christ died for us. And we've got a decision to make whether we're going to accept it, receive it, and respond to it, or whether you're going to deny it and put Christ again to an open shame. Is he literally coming down to go on the cross again? No. But every time that you turn against him, you're disregarding the sacrifice that he made for you and putting the name of Christ to shame before a sinful world that's still looking on. Instead, you can bring glory to the sacrifice. By the way, it's the reason that the cross is now revered and put upon the steeples and decorations in the church and in cemeteries and everywhere else. Because it's the symbol of deliverance. It's the symbol of the answer. It's no longer something to be shamed, but something to be lifted up and glorified because of the difference that was made upon it. Not by every man that ever died upon it, but because of one in particular, Jesus, who came as the Son of God. And so I ask you this morning, have you received the love of God, or are you continuing to reject it? Because the answer to that question makes the difference for you for all of eternity. Not just the difference that you live in the remainder of your life now, but for all of eternity when life is done. Stand with me together this morning, if you would.